All right, welcome to the March meeting. Um, I'm going to get through. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple quick announcements. Then we've got some show and tell. We've got some great stuff here in the room, uh, some other stuff online. Uh, I guess Peter Karopanowski is going to talk about two Uh We're very excited. And then we're going to have an opportunity table for those of us here in the room. Here we have a ton of stuff on that table. Uh, a lot of leftovers from people uh leftovers from poe so uh if you want to get a raffle ticket um you want to get some really nice ones here and yes here comes some really nice ones walking by yes everybody <laughs> online just got to see them so we, we can move uh, okay so with that out of the way yes <laughs> the first thing we want to talk about is this massive amount of new members. So, welcome everyone. I don't know if anyone's here in the room. Uh, good to be here in the room. Yeah. Great. Thank you all. Uh, Rhiannon Croce, Irene Lamby, Raymond Brinkman, Kim Connor, Dakota Sweat, Sharon Mon Palmasano, Lorraine Mercer, William Hernandez, Vanek, Dr. Bedrosier, Anna Shai, Richard Ernst, Lorraine Hoffman, Kristen Lindstrom, Sean McHenry, Julia Ortiz Aragon, uh, Catherine Hetch, Trevor Riddinger, Yang Su, and Judy Zoo. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're very excited to have you. Um, here we go. Um, other events that are going on, there is, of course, AOS judging right here, just in the next room. Um, we have that every meeting. So if you've got stuff you'd like to be judged, come on down, show it off. Um, there's also judging by Lowly uh, House and Gardens and Woodside. It's the third Saturday of every, mar of every morning, so that means it's on March uh, 18th. I'm going to say that wrong. Um, California Sierra Nevada Judging Center, they be judging every month. It's during the Sacramento Orphan Society. That was last week this month, uh, so the next time will be April 5th. Uh, there's more information on the screen. Uh, other events continue. Uh, Tom Berlini, local grower, vendor we all know, uh, is teaching growing orchids at City College of San Francisco. That's going to be Thursdays, April 6th to May 4th. That's in the mornings. Uh, you can still sign up. Uh, as of last night, you can still sign up. Um, uh, the AOS Spring Members Meeting is going to be in San Diego uh, next month. They've got a bunch of stuff going on. There's judging, there's a meeting of members in a town hall, uh, an auction, a banquet, and more. Um, you can go to aos.org for more details. Uh, events that we are putting on. Um, you're all here, of course. Next. Thank you for the highlights. Um, next Monday, we're going to have our standard uh, board and show committee meeting. Um, show committee. We just had our show, of course, but we're going to talk about uh, some details of the show, how it went. Um, if you've got suggestions for the future, please sign on and give us your thoughts. And of course, we're only 20 months away from our next show. Um, 20 weeks away. Um, next month, Lori Justin's going to talk about caring for orchids and caring for the web of life, possibly for growing orchids sustainably. Uh, she's right here in the room. Oh, now she's over here. Uh, should be great. And by popular demand, skill session part two. Um, we had a great discussion last month. A lot of people here in the room uh, with questions and answers from our experts. Um, so we're going to have some time for that as well. Um, then in two months, you know, it's board nominations. Um, if you want to get more involved, uh, there are opportunities. You can reach out to me. Again, I'm Adam. If you don't know me already, uh, Adam at OrchidSanFrancisco.org uh, or come up to me now. Um, we are still hoping to organize uh, tours of members' growing spaces. So if you have a space, if you want to have people come, Check out your space, see what you've got going on. Uh, reach out to us. Can I say something? Yes. <coughs> so I'm trying to 
to organize it. I think we have three people so far in San Francisco that are interested in opening their greenhouses so people can come around, see how small growers, you know, backyard growers are doing and, and share information. And uh, if there are other people that are interested, we'll do San Francisco first. And we're looking at May 6th, it's a Saturday. So uh, either if you're interested in, in having people come by your greenhouse, or if you're interested in just coming, uh, May 6th would be the date you can contact. May 6th is the first hour of the morning. Oh, it is. You might want to. Okay, we'll check the date and that we have time but if you're interested in, in uh, having people come by or you're interested in seeing people's greenhouses that will be main yeah. thanks so. um, or, or not or another or, day. yeah another day uh, continuing on yeah so i mentioned orchids and parks coming up just 20 weeks away july 29th, 30th right back here at the uh County okay, Fair building. Um, we're going to show some photos in just a second. Just some quick stuff will be on the website um, from last weekend or two weekends ago. Show. Um, but before that, I'm going to pass it up to Jeff. He's going to talk about Orchid Digest magazine. Yes. So we're pushing Orchid Digest. Uh, we have several of us are on the board trying to help them. They're able to kind of manage publishing the magazines, but they're trying to raise their subscriber base. Um, they have amazing high quality photography. So they actually sent us uh, 20 magazines for the print issue, which I have more on my table if you want them. Uh, trying to get you to take a first hand look. Uh, so besides your magazine, they sponsor trips, they um, have certain days. So consider subscribing and becoming a member of Orchid Digest. Yes. No, it's originally from this from the Pacific Coast, but it's it's an international group. But yeah, a lot of it is based out of Huntington and, and yeah, Pasadena. Yeah. Yeah. The Arctic Digest um, Corporation is based in the Huntington um, Botanical Gardens. We also sponsor the Batfield and Speaker's Days in June and an occasional webinar. If you join them, I think being 50, whatever it is, you get access, you get access to all of that uh, at a member's rate or free. So if you join them, you get the magazine and you get all the benefits of the American Diet Corporation and the sponsoring events. So it's really a good deal. I will say this, the magazine is a quarter. So unlike with the AOS, you keep spending your summer every month and it stacks up and you keep feeling guilty and you want to <laughs> you know, throw yourself into your greenhouse and never come back out. The Urban Digest is a quarter and it's, I think, higher quality in terms of the photography and sometimes they have, like you open up your center fold and instead of a naked lady, it's like a <laughs> dust practice, yeah, you've never seen or something like that. But it's really, really high quality. It's probably better than the naked lady. It's probably better than the naked lady. Anyway, um, so I would uh, I would urge joining um, uh, very much. Yeah. Uh, great. I'm going to go through a couple of Yes, here's some more information. We should download even. Check that out. Orchiddigest.com. Um, so here are some pictures from two weekends ago. Let's see how quickly they go. Oh, good. Uh, Bill, Bill Weaver uh, went around and did people photos uh, this year. And then um, several others of us collected ours. And we're trying to get it all organized for Eugene, uh, his newsletter. So that's it's really hard to list every volunteer and every person. So we don't have that. So just have a flash. We have a list of volunteers. No, I don't know. That's 
Yeah, thanks everyone who came out. Over 100 people a day were volunteering just to help us run the show every day, not trying to get the word. There's all the hard work that went into setting it up. I took a picture of Bill. Oh, no. <laughs> there was there. Yeah, yeah. It's worked. <laughs> Okay. He has other hobbies too. <laughs> Show it up. Oh, we have t-shirts for sale. Oh, you want? There's a box for that. I forgot my notes. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I just do whatever I can to know. Sounds great. No, it doesn't. <laughs> you know, we'll see. Okay. Okay, well, maybe you can do the, the table for me. Do you want to do online first? Yeah. Okay. Let's, might as well. Can we cut some white so you can get the real colors on these? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is Judy Cardi's. Bottle fell on the platform. You might have seen it in the Marin uh, exhibit at PLE. I believe it got a really nice award. I can't remember what. It's a miniature. Sorry? No. You're okay. Just take it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's. And I have to apologize right now in advance. I forgot my notes, so I'm going to tell you what I remember. And some of you know something we think the group would like to hear about one of these. Speak up. So here's Dave Her Hermeyer's uh, Dendrobium Jonathan's Glory. This is one of the, the Australian dendrobiums. It's about half Timianum and a quarter Tetragonum, which we'll see later, actually. And a couple others make up the rest of the hybrid. So it's very tolerant, easy to grow. Dave probably grows it outside. Here's his uh, Catlia Persevaliana summit. Um, I think one of the Brazilian. No, no, Venezuela. Or, thank you. That's, yes, I remember now. It, it's from Venezuela. And it's named after a man named Ursula. It is fairly tolerant about temperature. And as it gets huge flowers, as you can see, it's a beautiful thing. Here's Roberta's uh, Opus, 10 thread Renifera, um, which means that it, there's a wasp by that name. So it's named after that wasp. And you can see that the inside of the Opus looks like a wasp or a bubble. Some of them look just like bumblebees, they're so cute. They're, uh, well, you can see, she said they're European and North African and uh, terrestrial. So <clears throat> they go dormant in the winter time. Here's her Campanula orcus, uh, Glovifera, which is native to Vietnam, grows outdoors for her, blooms very nicely. And the next one, here it is. Okay, I don't know how that happened. Okay. Um, Diaris magnifica is called the donkey orchid. You can see the ears, which is why it's named that. It's a terrestrial in Western Australia. And Roberta grows these terrestrials that I didn't think we could grow here because they needed whatever the Mycorrhiza 
in their native lands were. So um, she's certainly doing it successfully in Southern California. Yeah, they they don't they don't need anything in particular. I mean, they mycorrhiza. It's uh, they just uh, they just uh, grow. Well, they certainly do for you. I can see that. <laughs> it's great. Where do you get them, Roberta? The the Australian ones. The trick it is, it is it's called myorchids.de. In, in Germany, uh, I you know I have a friend, Scott McGregor, is also in. Southern California, he went to the trouble of getting an import permit so we could do the whole thing. Uh, I also get some of the Europeans there. There's also uh, a gal on, uh, in Greece on eBay who, uh, who sells the European terrestrials. And uh, actually it takes a lot less time to get the ones from Greece. We usually have them in about 10 days. And the ones from Germany sometimes take a month or more. But since they're dormant, the uh, green, greens like the color is what the name of it is greens like the color green 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 the uh, greens like like the uh, the country okay thank you um next we have tanya lambs dendrobium tetragona which is one of the species in the uh, uh dendrobium we saw before it's a one of the really tough australian dendrobiums uh, epiphytic, grow on rocks or trees, and very tolerant of, of conditions. Here's Tanya's uh, Sideria deponica. I just found out that Sideria is Erides backwards, what's <laughs> name? And um, this actually is now a Phalaenopsis. So, and it's from Japan. Yeah. We've got more than one. All right, I guess this is right. Um, here's my Maxillaria cacoensis. I corrected these. Um, it's from Costa Rica, and in this case, cacao does not mean chocolate. It's the name of the hill they found it on. So it likes intermediate. Uh, conditions. It's a relatively small plant and bloomed for me the first time this time. Here's my Maxillaria tonsbergia. It's a uh, bergia. Did you download this a while ago? I corrected these names. Oh, anyway, okay. It's tonsbergii and named after a man that some of the Members uh, say, remember, I know Judy Carney knew him. He was active in our society. I, it was found by Eric Christensen like, in South America. Now, uh, intermediate, uh, the ruler behind there is about 18 inches. So you can see how big that plant is and how big the, the flower is a good six, eight inches. Well, I didn't bring it in person because it has another bud hanging off the side and it surely would have broken if I hadn't moved it. Uh, this is Ziegler's Love, Golden Gate. So Tom Felitti got the FCC on this plant. His plant that was awarded had, I think it was 45 flowers on it. Yeah, wow, that's right. I can't imagine what that would look like. Interestingly enough, all the other Ziegler's Love um, pictures on the internet are in the pink to purple range. So I don't know how he meant it, uh, why this one is white with the yellow, but I certainly like it. In the in the background, you can see my three-inch ruler. So this is a this is a good size flower as well for a mastabalia. Um, and this one's really tiny, the Phalaenopsis thailandica, which is from Thailand, as you can see. It's a grow it intermediate, and uh, I don't really have much else to say about it. It's really cute. Okay, that's the end of the virtual show and tell. That's the ones on the page. Yeah, and so we have we have a plant table here, which Carol has uh, 
because just because everybody else grows something one way, you may have a different plant, a different species, comes from a different habitat. Very nicely grown, and also has a bud coming out. Uh, Dave, Don? Yes, that, I don't have a name for that. You don't have a name for this. This is a light cast. I know. I know. Uh, what do you think, Shani? Looks like an item light cast. You can have yourself this. I don't even want to see it, but it's got really nice. Yes. These are very, very hard to grow. The large leaves make make you understand that it likes good air movement. It grows in places where it's going to get a lot of good air movement. And these uh, flowers are notorious for being easily bruised. So even judges who normally want to touch a flower for substance or measure it or pedal with or something are extremely careful to do this. The most egregious example was an awarded light cast. He was being carried to a table for the photographer and the student judge. Oh, <laughs> fell down. So they had to take a picture of the pieces. Oh, 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 yeah, that, that was not that was not the best day. I don't know if that student's still around. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been me, actually. Might have been me. So here is a Zygopendulum cross, Advanced Australia. Actually, it's a regular species, right? Yeah, Advanced Australia is what, the Brecht's name or the? Yes, the Brecht's name. So it's a hybrid. Um, Steve Monkhouse in Australia was Mr. Zygopendulum. Zygopendulums come from South America, so I don't know how that happened. But Steve Monkhouse for many years was working on zygo hybrids, hence the name Advanced Australia, which I believe is a national. 
Oh. Steve moved to Bali and then started trying to hybridize warm brine zygons, but he didn't have much uh, success. So alas, he's sitting in Bali all by himself with no nothing to do. <laughs> Beautiful the ground. You know, the thing about zygos, they're not only great for his climate, they have tremendous fragrance. And now you can ask Mitch. They are hybridizing the zygos left and right with beautiful blue colors, all kinds of things. It's Reds, lights, yeah. yeah. The Bams Australia is one of the smaller growing ones, so it won't get as tall as a toddler like the rest of the zygos. We have here a bit. Is this Betsy yeah. on? Yeah. Here's the flagship of the Mazda Bali. It's yes. Yes. the largest flower, I believe, in the group. One of the largest. And he's in hybridizing with everything. It's big, it has high substance, it's got these fuzzy little hairs on it that sometimes show purple color, depending on the light. And this is from Gioff. Gioff, <laughs> <laughs> very nice. Yeah. You're a good grower. Yeah, he's a pretty little soccer nice. No, now, Catlia, I know. Right. Soccer is uh, now a Catlia, but that doesn't mean we have to, you know, actually call it that. It's a cool, relatively cooler grower. Uh, a lot of people have been very upset and frustrated with the reorganization of the Catlea genus, especially the Lilia perforata crowd. Uh, anyway, uh, one, where'd you get the climate through? Is this 4M? No, it seems it's off it's the door. Okay. And you grow it outside or? In the uh, it's grown in a cool greenhouse down in uh, San Mateo, so kind of. Right next door to the beach down there. I grew it down in San Diego as well. And grew it outside. In San Diego? Mm -hmm. Oh, so you have two growing areas. No, no, that's where I used to live. Oh, okay. I moved up here. Yeah, they, when I saw them in Brazil, it was pretty hot, the temperature. You know. Okay. Well, yeah, during the day. Alan has done some fantastic breeding. He's now up with that 12 of the worm tolerance. I got one to survive 130 this summer. Yeah. Wow. I mean, the main thing is that they need to, yeah. they'll take actually fairly warm day. They, just, they get really resentful if it's kind of yeah. mid 60s and above. And, yeah, too. Yeah. My, my cool grower suffered. I live on the East Bay of the Haley Hills mm -hmm. and I get a nice day breeze mostly. And when we have those heat spells, those nights were still 72, 75 degrees. My Drax, my Mozzies, oh, yeah. and, and my Sopranitis. But they, they're used to cooling down. This is a Brazia, no label. So there's no ID. This could be shooting stars. This could be a number of them. Um, really, really easy to grow plant. Great for beginners. And nicely bloomed out because it's always got a lot of flowers on it. And, and, and this is uh, Dr. Don or Dan Nadler? Don. 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 Use your glasses. Use your glasses. Okay. <laughs> another life nasty. We have another life nasty, slightly different mahogany. Mahogany is the name. Yeah. The hybrid. Got a little bit of, we should maybe trim our leaves a little bit before we bring it in. Other than that, no. Now, the thing is, is some people, when they bring in a life nasty for judging, they'll actually trim all the leaves off or they'll plate them together. So They'll weave them together to get them out of the way so we can see the flower better. Okay, and that's Dan Anderson's plant. Dan Anderson has one nice flower and one bud. Very nicely grown. Good. And this is here. You pick that. I'm oh, sorry. Dendrobrian Williamsonii. Uh, we got what two two little flowers? On yeah. There? An interesting, and this is from uh, Jay. Who's this? That's Jan Anderson. Jan That's Anderson. from India. That's from India. Do you give it any kind of dry rest or anything? Is it one of those kinds? The reason I ask is, you see that the blooms are coming outside the sides of the cane on old leaf nodes. And that's usually a characteristic of dendrobrines that bloom on leafless canes out after a dry rest. Notice the, the one that has the blooms is leafless and the peduncles are coming out of a, a node in, in a cane. So that's usually an indication that it, it likes to dry rest. 
Bursting out of its pot. It's Maxillaria cacoensis. They have a lovely scent. I really like the scent. So, do you think you're going to pot it anytime soon? <laughs> you, well, you got that lead coming out, but the reason I asked I, is. Yeah, so we cut that away, I guess. And really well, you cut the pot. Yeah, yeah you, you have the option to cut it. Okay, all right, good. No, no, no. All right, good. Now that we have yeah. that understood. Now, yeah. why don't we see more maxillarias? Sarah, yeah. I have lots. Of there are lots of those. Besides K, why don't we see that? <laughs> and the forever. reason is, is that it's no, hard they're not. Hybridizers never like to have flowers that are so low in the foliage. They no. want something that's going to rise above. There's going to be some breakthrough, and we're going to see a lot of maxillaria This is really cute. This is really cute. I call it the mosquito plant. Yeah, yeah. it looks like a burger. I mean. <laughs> yeah. It, Dan Newman. This is a scapel cephalum gibber rasmum. Give her Russell. And uh, uh, Dan Newman would sell lots of these. I uh, haven't seen Dan in a while, but it's a cool grower for sure. Yeah, exactly. I got it from Andy's Yeah. I grow it indoor and inside Greenhouse Patterns. So, her black dark and warmer is Ah. K Club brings in a dendrobium capituliflorum. And this is another dendrobium that likes a slight dry rest and blooms from leafless canes. It's a little bit compact. You can see the little, what we call the pom poms, coming out of the bracts of the canes here. It's a really stubby plant. This is so nicely grown. This is an older plant. Yes, I've had yeah. it. I got it. Usually you see them and they're about a third of this size. But do y'all see the pom poms? Yeah, I think so. Then it'll go on screen. Screen. <laughs> I'm getting seasick again. Yeah. You see that? You see and that? It's, yeah. it's, it's from New Guinea. So yeah, it's from New Guinea. And if you have me back from my dendrobiums of New Guinea, you'll see the slide that has this. But they call this the white pom pom. And again, it needs the dry rest to go dormant. How do you? I don't think it's out there. There we go. It needs the dry rest to go dormant. And then it, again, just like the other dendrogram, it blooms from the nodes of the leafless canes. So you know you've done a great job. Kay has done a very good job culturally <laughs> uh, for this. Kay also brings in an Angracum leonis. Uh, this has got a really nice fan, almost bandacious uh, look to it. Uh, the spurs are kind of curled up. I didn't realize they were so curly. Um, again, uh, grown on a mat. This is an Andy's orchid. Andy's? No, yeah. I don't think so. Wait, how do we, do we do this? There we go. You can see how well grown it is, how many fans it has. A couple in the back, a couple in the front, and then all the blooms right here. Okay. And that, that's from the, the Comoros. And um, I was complaining to Ron Parsons about why wasn't this thing blooming a couple of years ago. And he said, hang it high in the greenhouse. And it worked. OK, that is all of the plants we have today. Yeah, we want that. <laughs> OK, now what? Me? Yeah, now I, think so. I can introduce you, or you can just take off. Oh, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name's Carol. I. Uh, I really enjoyed your show. I was a volunteer for the OCA, and also I was the Florida Ballad Alliance moss lady for the volcano. So, uh, nothing gets done until the moss lady's done. Um, anyway, uh, thank you for having me tonight. I'm an accredited judge with the California Sierra Nevada Judging Center, uh, but I live in Hayward, California, so I can come here often. I, I'm trying to resurrect the Orchid Society of California. I bet I was telling Jeff. Hold it together and even I think advance uh, your society meetings by adapting to the new Zoom formats, 
Um, hello to everyone out there in Zoom land and the ships at sea and all that. I don't know exactly how many are on the call. Anyway, uh, wonderful society, and I'm happy to be here to talk about Columbia's tonight. So why don't I go get my clicker? And can we put my uh, thing up? Okay. While he's doing that, do you have a raffle table tonight that consists of plants left over from the show that are in wonderful condition? And a bunch of Columbia's on the left hand side, uh, provided by Dennis Olivas. Look at this. This is a Columbia. Columbia's are a relatively recent genus. They were discovered in about 1800s uh, when everything was either an epidendrum, a banda, or a cat, or a capital. And gradually they moved to Oncidium. And then in 1986, they became Columbia's. They were reclassified by a taxonomist named Rio Green in 1986. And you can see why. If you look at the, the, the leaves, the leaves are quite succulent and hard. And onsidians are usually a, a nice soft uh, leaf and very long. So I guess for that and other reasons, he uh, did what they call it. He raised them to generic range of Columbia. And ever since the hybridization has uh, been building upon some preliminary work done in the 50s by a gentleman I'll introduce you to in a few minutes. And also, I should say, uh, the other name for this type of orchid is Equitant Oncidium. Now, it's not an Oncidium anymore, it's a Columbia, but the, the phrase Equitant Oncidium, which you're going to hear a lot if you grow and collect these. Because epitaphic is Latin, a Latinate kind of phrase that uh, refers to the fact that the leaves at the base kind of straddle one another, just like a rider straddling a horse when he's in the saddle. And also, uh, there's a species name, Tripetra, which is again Latin for triangular or three shaped, and that also refers to the way the leaf axles meet and form sort of a three sided triangle at the base of the plant. So all in all, we have a fugitive from the Oncidium uh, genus that is not an Adamoglossum, it's a Columbia. This is a size. <laughs> um, this is a size that is actually quite large for the plant. This is about a three inch pot, and the plant's about three and a half to four inches high. It's already gotten a spike from the last not cut this way. It's completely ground hard because it can always be removed from it. Some of them branch. I think that they're without a cut branch. But you can end up, it just has another couple of fans with a couple of spikes. It's a very impressive specimen for, for the size of the plant. You can have a dozen uh, Columbia's that fit in shoebox. Who doesn't have room for that? <laughs> so they make excellent visits in front of them. And uh, except for a few cultural things, you uh, you can grow these easily anywhere. And now I'll start my talk. So Columbia's, as I said, was raised to generic rank in 1986, but they've been around, of course, since, since forever, and they discovered them in the 1830s. Um, the hybridization I referred to started in the 50s um, by a gentleman that I'll introduce you to. But let's just say that all of the brightly colored telomeres you see nowadays, with all of their pretty colors and their wonderful patterns and peripherals to this, um, all came about because of one man's love of pineapples. It's true. First of all, the, this couple center on, I pretty much gave you the text amount of background. Then we'll go into some important species, some background for the breeding. And, and I'm going to introduce you to. Then the importance of the most famous Columbia of all, Columbia Golden Sunset. So modern breeding that's coming out of uh, Southeast Asia and then some culture and medicine. So as I said, Columbia, wait, should I stand in front of this couple? I bet you. Okay. And then everyone on Zoom knows they can read the chat. Great. Uh, Western Caribbean. So here's Florida. There's one Columbia in the very, very tip of Florida, right about here. Um, but from the Bahamas and, and all of Cuba and uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti, everybody's got their own little 
endemic to uh, that thrives in trees and some, some loose leaf mulch on the ground. It thrives on this brief period of showers and then these trade winds bringing air movement to dry out the roots. These are classic epiphytic orchids. So they like to have their moisture and then they like to dry out and put it in the soil. Uh, as I said, they were uh, discovered in the 1800s when everything was an epidemic or something else. Equiton oncidiums uh, is kind of the common name for them, but then Boydou Green uh, was a taxonomist that elevated them out of Oncidia into their own genus. So here we have, you can see clearly the way the leaf axis come down and form that sort of three-sided straddling thing. And you can see also how tall the spike is relative to the size of the plant. That's a good thing in some ways, but it also makes the plant a little top heavy because the blooms do not go along the entire inflorescence. They cluster at the top. Uh, there are some species that are used in back crosses to reduce the size of the spike of the one in order to make it seem like a more rounded uh, bloom. But this is your basic classic columnia aspect here. Notice the very few fine roots completely devoid of bark or anything, probably sitting in a pot or a mound and just getting rained on and then dried out on and on every single day in the Caribbean. It's got this very, so this is the distinctive classic pattern. If that one I showed you just now was in bloom, it would look very similar to this. Just a nice cluster of fan-like leaves. Almost, look, they look like fan is what they're not, of course, they're sympodial rather than terminal, but um, they have that band of look with very tall, skinny inflorescence with flowers clustered at the top. Um, they bloom, bloom from about now through fall, but it's not just a one-time bloom, they can bloom multiple times. So you get multiple blooms, sometimes on the same spike, uh, between now and probably Thanksgiving. They're kind of tiny, actually. You saw the size of that thing. <clears throat> Hold it in my hand and it's very tough. Consider that a mature plant. Cat is a gigantic. I mean, the thing that Shawnee brought in is a poster child for what a Catlea can do. It's amazing. But um, despite that, they have their own really, really charming beauty that even though they're small, they really can bring a spot to your face. Um, now, some people call these plants dancing ladies. Now, I'm, I hate to be picky, but dancing ladies actually refer. Do you like my wine glass? It's the same. Thing. Dancing ladies is actually a specific epithet for a specific kind of plant bred in Singapore in the 1930s when the Singapore Botanical Gardens was trying to jumpstart the pet flower industry. So they have their bandas and Southeast Asia. They have their the Jobrians, they have all these warm growers all over the place. They wanted a cool growing hot plant that could be used for pet flowers. So they went to South America and found a big yellow, I think it was on Sidium Berry Gotham or something like that. The big yellow thing, and they bred it for the cut flower industry and they named it the Dancing Ladies. And that's how the term got started. But now they call every yellow oncidium like flower a dancing lady plant. It's just, I just thought I'd set the record straight. But anyway, so here's a nice example of the color variety that you get in telomeres. You have just the beautiful sort of um, dark centers. You've got the brilliant flowers on the edges, all kinds of flowers, reds, purples, magentas, and um, they are intermediate to warm growing, although I grow my in a strictly intermediate, barely heated uh, greenhouse right now, and it does just fine. Uh, bright light with Cattleyas, but not band of light. The difference is simply bright light, uh, Cattleya light is a little bit, it, it's a, a notch down from band of light. It's, uh, it's more filtered. Um, you can still see a distinct shadow, but it's not so bright as to burn the leaves or anything. Um, it telomeres love high humidity, they do not have pseudobulbs, so they need that high humidity so they don't shrivel up. And uh, like I said, they will often branch, particularly on older uh, plants or the same spike. So here's an example we have these uh, over here on the table, but we also have 
an example here, there is no media in these pots. All they are is just like we show, I, I showed you in the last slide where it's just a, a fan of flowers with a clump of roots and the pot is only there to support the plant so it doesn't fall over or something. And these things get wet and then they dry out. I brought some telumnias home from Puerto Rico a few years ago and they were in two inch pots. And the first thing I said to uh, Carlos Spaghetti um, as he was taking me to the airport is, well, I gotta go repot these, that pot these things back up. He goes, no, don't touch them. So just leave them by a root in that clay pot forever. Mm -hmm. Just make sure they dry out um, before sundown. And I did, and I killed a few, but I also still have a few. So mm -hmm. I learned the hard way, but, uh, and that's what they like. They, they just do not want to be wet going into nighttime. Plants are six to eight inches at maturity, so it is a true miniature orchid. Perfect for windowsills or uh, under the lights in your bathroom, spare bathroom, or even in your greenhouse, but uh, they might get lost amongst all the cat leaves and some videos and things. And specimens can be comfortably put in a four inch pot. That's a three inch pot we saw there. That's about as as well grown up to London. You can get it to this uh, size. They're actually happiest, just like most epithetic orchids, when they're mounted. Uh, I'm an overwaterer, or they call you happy hoser or whatever they call you. That's me. That's me. And um, and so I've taken most of my cattleyas out of their pots and I mount them. Uh, I mount almost everything because uh, I just love to water. I don't know why. I think it, there's something psychologically wrong with me if you really <laughs> want to know. But um, uh, but being an epiphytic orchid grower, uh, my obsession with watering and mounting orchids tend to be successful because uh, they can get wet, absorb and hydrate, and then with airflow, dry out. And everybody at Leia's, everybody who's an epiphytic plant really, really wants that kind of rinse and repeat kind of uh, situation. So hybridization has evolved very quickly with these plants because the turnaround from seeds and flasks to blooms is less than three years. So even though the hybridization effort started in the 50s, there had been so many generations of telumnias coming out, hand-picked, fine-bred, old crosses remade in, in just 50, 60 years, whereas Back the Edelons had been hybridized for almost 200 years. Wait, 1849, so what is that? 150 years. Almost 200 if you go forward 150 <laughs> <laughs> Almost 25, yeah. Anyway, the point is, is they bloom pretty quickly. And so the hybridization effort has moved along just as quickly. So we would find our current hybrids, the ones that have been crossed about three, four years ago and are now being put onto the benches of the vendors that shows and things. These hybrids uh, are quite complex with many generations of uh, material in their backgrounds. So the important species are the first four, Coachella, Triketra, Guianensis, and Urophil. These four species are in almost every, are in almost, not almost every, every hybrid. Uh, from uh, in the Tonga genome right now. And it's just like with complex paths, where I think it was the lonesome and, and insignia, never, almost every complex path has about four or five basic foundation species in all of them. Same with Tolumnus. These four are what's called the foundation species for every hybrid. Then they add Kenakenii, Variegata, Vitata, Priocylum. Quadrilova and these two uh, endemics to Haiti and the Bahamas. And uh, with a back cross of them, you enhance certain characteristics. So let's look at some of the Fab Four. This is the type species for the genus. What does that mean? The type species is the species that defines the genus. It's the species that says all telumnias have big, wide lips, have happy, dancey, Petals, you know, this is the happy dancer thing going on the short dorsal. This is the type species. This is what a colonia should look like. And this has a wide lip, beautiful color range from pink to purple, little white inside, very excellent shape, 
very well held. They don't crowd on the inflorescence and they can branch. So very nice and temperature tolerant, which means that even though it grows in the Caribbean, it can adapt to intermediate temperatures in San Francisco. It's got a lot of awards and tons of progeny because it's in every friggin' Ptolemyia hybrid there is. Same thing with Triketra. Triketra is that Latin phrase for triangular. And you can see by the shape of the flower why that was probably given the name. Uh, it has a range of colors from white backgrounds to deep purple, lots of markings and spots and patterns. This brings, you'll see how there's so many crazy patterns that are in some of these blooms. And it, a lot of it comes from the Triketra plant. Uh, it has a compact plant habit, which before you laugh, I mean, how much more compact can you get? Look at <laughs> the whole grown plant, it's still compact. What it really means is, is if it brings down the size of the spike and the plant size is small, it'll be more compact and less ungainly looking to have all those clusters of blooms on the top of the spike. I think that's what that means. Uh, because it shortens the inflorescence. Again, lots of awards and progeny. Weonensis is also called Desitorum. This has a nice round petal shape. It is so famous in Cuba, they made a postage stamp out of it. Uh, it has a lot of different color ranges and it gives <clears throat> flowers a little bit bigger, but it also decreases the flower count. Uh, the most prized color is the solid yellow that you see here. Urophila, the final one of the Fab Four. Looks like your classic dancing lady on sitting, doesn't it? It's got the branching and semi-pendent inflorescence. It's got that beautiful concord yellow uh, kind of skirt, you know, and then the, here's the happy lady dancing and stuff like that. Um, really nice. Uh, I think the size and the expanded lip is what, what it brings to the table in terms of the hybrids. And it's got at least four awards for the species and a lot of progeny. Some other species, Penakenii, looks like one of the bee orchids that we saw in Schoenville. It actually does have a quite an interesting uh, hirsute substance on the lip. Uh, Variegata has fragrance. So some of these columnias, if it has a bit of fragrance, a very pleasing one, I might add, it's probably coming from a Variegata parent. We have Futata which means spotted in Latin. You notice how I'm good at Latin? I speak really good Latin. <laughs> well, that's three words so far anyway. <laughs> anyway, uh, Pri Prionachilla here and Philatina. I could not get a bigger photo that would scale, but I really like the colors here. You, did, you don't see too much purple like this in, uh, in uh, Tolumnes. And that's a really pretty combination there with the yellow color right above the lip. We also have quadrilova here, almost brown, and hadiensis, the Haitian oncidium that is on another postage stamp. And finally, we have bahamensis. This occurs in the Bahamas. It's in southern, southeastern Florida. And look at the size of the plant here is about the size of the plant I've showed you. But look at the spikes. They're rising up six, eight, maybe 10, 12 inches out of the picture and it's growing in leaf litter, uh, maybe a branch or two here laying on the ground, but basically leaf litter. These are epiphytic plants. This is still going to want all those roots to get wet and then dry out. Uh, it's just going to get less air movement because it's a little bit low on the ground in that picture. Now I want to introduce you to some people. This is John Moyer with the funny mustache. John Moyer was a Scottish immigrant to the big island of Hawaii. And he got into growing sugarcane. What does this have to do with orchids? Bear with me, please. Uh, he was one of the best known sugar planters in all of Hawaii. So when the pineapple people came knocking, they said, you're the best sugarcane guy. We want you to come work for us. So he did. So the first thing they did is they sent him out all <clears> over <throat> the place. They're in Hawaii. So they sent him to the tropics in the uh, South Pacific and other places to look for new pineapple genetic material. What's the thing we know most about pineapples? They're vermilions. And where did vermilions come from? The New World. So basically, they bring 
trust of the pineapple company sent him in the wrong direction. Well, that's good for us. You know why? Because he went to the Philippines and he found orchids. And he said, pineapples, not so much, but I love orchids. You know how it is. He found them in situ. He, there was no sightings, no money. He had the back, he had ship or whatever he had. He found orchids and he started bringing orchids back instead of pineapples. I don't know if he got fired or not, but he did start an incredible orchid collection uh, in the late 1800s into the early 1900s. At Please Anyway, it was just before World War II and John Moyer died. Uh, so a man named Herbert Shipman got his collection and Herbert was bored. He was a big cattle rancher in Kohala on the Big Island. He didn't care that much about cattle ranching. So when he found out that the Nene geese on the Big Island were becoming extinct, he threw his whole fortune and effort into saving the Nene goose. And, he, and it worked. We have the Nene goose today, alive today. It would have been a dodo kind of situation, but we have those Nene geese alive today because of Herbert Shipman. But then he got bored with that and he bought Mr. Moyer's orchid collection became one of Hawaii's first commercial orchid growers right after World War II. So World War II changed everything uh, for a lot of orchid hybridizers. It used to be Singapore Botanical Garden was uh, ramping up in the 1930s, as I said. Uh, the Thais were uh, involved, the Japanese and the Koreans, they all were involved in orchid hybridization <laughs> and a, more or less on small scale. But then World War II happened and the Japanese occupied most of these countries. And the last thing anyone could do is freely walk about taking care of orchid collections. Uh, so Singapore and Southeast Asia gave way to Hawaii. Now what happened to Hawaii was just the opposite. The military came in, there are now roads, there's airports. They subsidized the universities to produce engineers and, and plumbers and people that could you know, do things, make things, maintain things. They even subsidized the existing pineapple and sugarcane industries for agriculture and jump started that little unknown thing called orchid uh, hybridization. So Hawaii benefited immensely from World War II in the sense that it allowed their orchid, their, their little orchid mm -hmm. industry of small growers here and there to expand and to be able to ship things out via airplanes and stuff, move things around on the new roads that they built, and in general, uh, get help from the universities for any of their agricultural problems. Still, it was hard to do orchid hybridization, to actually figure out how to cross two different orchids and get the thing you want out of those parents. Enter the star of our show, besides me. <laughs> the star is W.W. W. Goodale Moyer the son of John Moore. Now, Goodale, he grew up and saw his father's orchid collection. He was interested. He was interested in everything. He lived in Hawaii, he lived in Oahu. There's a place where, I don't know if the house is still there, but there's a place in Oahu where the trade winds come this way and that way. It's, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful area for growing things because of all the air movement, trade winds, and of course, Hawaii climate is pretty amenable. Uh, to growing a lot of things. So he actually was, oh gosh, he grew everything. He grew all the Catleas, he grew uh, sugar cane samples, he grew everything. Uh, but what he really, really liked was bromeliads. He was the first person to go out and he didn't mind the pineapple type things, but he really liked the other bromeliads that grew in Central America and stuff that were really different. And so he started bringing these to Hawaii. He was assisted by his wife, May, who some say really was the, the grower behind the grower in the sense that she knew how to do a lot of the things um, uh, to make these plants thrive. In fact, look at this bromeliad sitting right here um, with a spike behind it um, with a smile on both their faces. Anyway, when you go to an AOS members meeting and you look at the book sales they're having, you'll still find Goodale Moyers, and everybody called him Goodale, you'll find his books still in demand. They are so precise and so informative about how to create orchid hybrids, just 
what the process is, what, what's happening there. And because of all that wisdom, uh, the people in Hawaii, a lot of the growers, they'll every now and then you just hear them talking stuff and they say something like, well, I remember what Goodale said or something like that. Uh, I think he died in 1985. So there are a lot of people alive today who still remember a uh, talking story with him in the, in the islands. Anyway, he was the first person to introduce non-pineapple <clears throat> bromeliads. So I'm sure his father was spitting in his grave or something. But anyway, the point is, is he was the guy who really wanted to collect bromeliads. So where did he go? He went to the New World. He went to the Caribbean. But just like his father, the thing he went to get, he didn't care for that much anymore once he found bromeliads. And he found out Sidiums, and then he especially found the Talonians and fell in love with these plants and brought them back to the Big Island. I'm sorry, Oahu. So, he was basically the guy who pioneered all the Tolomian breeding we see today. Everything we see today is based on 25 years of intense hybridization effort by Goodale Moyer. And, and it, he did have people that he mentored. We'll see that in a second. But the point is, we wouldn't be here unless the pineapples that attracted the, the companies to send his father out for orchids and also made Goodale Moyer wanted to go to the Caribbean has produced this obsession and this triumph of breeding with Telonia orchids. Uh, he called them weeds because every time he'd go to an orchid show, there'd be a big catlea like Shawnee's, or there'd be a giant dendrobium spatulata envelope type, seven feet high, filled with all these, you know, kind of twisty petal things, beautiful, beautiful plants. And then there'd be his three inch specimen with a six inch like. But it was really colorful and everything, and people were not aware, but he just called them weeds compared to the, the more decorative ones. But I'm sure he was just being modest. So by the 70s, now he went, he started in the mid-50s. He went to, until about the mid-70s when he mentored people like Richard and Stella Mazuda and Robert and Susan Perriera uh, with his Tolumnia hybridization. And these people were the ones who took his plant material and really started making commercially viable hybrids with it. Both of these couples are very well-known growers in Hawaii already, already <clears throat> but the Perrieras especially. I mean, we do see their name on a couple of man-made genuses in Vandas, for example. Uh, Bangkok, I think it's Perriera Bangkok Sunset's one of the most famous. It's a Vanda cross. But they also um, took some of Goodale Moyer's breeding program and produced something called Tolumnia Golden Sunset. It was registered by a friend of his, Francis Isaac, I think, and um, in 1975, but they were the ones who produced it and uh, it, it changed everything as we'll see in a minute. But when they passed on, their collection went to it, many Hawaiian growers and also a very, very nice gentleman in San Diego. Some of you might know him, Helmut Roll. Helmut passed about 10 years ago. And here he is at the Taiwan International Orchid Show <coughs> teaching a clueless student judge um, <laughs> something about this. Uh, well, it's not a Tolumni, it's a path, but I didn't know that at the time and he was trying to explain it to me. Anyway, the point is Helmut, uh, Helmut um, grew Odons on Sidiums and all kinds of cool growers like that. He's a very, he was a very close friend of Bob Hamilton up here. They would have their Odon pieces going back and forth up the West Coast. Wonderful, wonderful man. Anyway, so he got some and so now we have a presence in Southern California for some of this breeding from Goodale. So the 70s and 80s were kind of a critical mass moment where the breeding uh, that Goodale had done for so many decades came to fruition with the people like Susan Perriera and uh, the Mizunas and Helmut. And we started seeing results like here's a golden sunset with the spots and, and deep saturated color. And here's a Susan Perriera Columnia hybrid. Uh, these are in 1975, 1977. We're starting to see things come out of this breeding program that are looking uh, very, very different than the species that underlie them. And with Tolemnia Golden Sunset, what <clears throat> happened was you got a cross that produced such variation in progeny that 
you can't even believe where some of this uh, some of this material came from. For example, look at the yellow and the mahogany here, solid color in the petals and some beautiful spotting in the lip. Same cross, completely red on a white background with red saturation and white tips on the distal portions of the petals. Same cross, just came out of different prodigies, uh, in a progeny, different progeny. Uh, it's the most prolific pair in all of Tumonia breeding. There's a little golden sunset in almost everything you're going to see, unless you see a species. Uh, like I said, oops, like I said, immense, oops, back, back. Uh, immense range of colors and patterns. And this passes on to the progeny. And it was all based on the breeding by Goodale Moyer and the Periotes. So here we have the four foundation uh, species, the Chella, Triketa, Glyphensis, and Myrtilla here. And then here you see one parent of Golden Sunset, Stanley Smith with these parents. And here's the other parent, Tiny Tim, with Triketra and Guianensis. And now we see, hello? Now we see the immense range that we could find from that cross. These are clonal names, Golden Glory. Golden Sunset, Golden Glory here. Here's a Susan Walker, Fox Den. Here's one almost completely solid red, Lone Star. And then Sonoma over here. This one I like to, in particular for the Picatinny on the petals. Anyway, look at the variety out of this one cross from those four foundation species um, that we were talking about. So just unbelievable. So anything, so Golden Sunset then became the go-to for any other species that they found in the genus because they knew not only were they going to get probably a surprise or two from the, the mixture, the genetics in the, in the mixture, <clears throat> but also that they were going to accentuate something in that golden sunset from the species that was going to probably produce something characteristic, hopefully pleasing. Excuse me. <coughs> I'm just getting over a cold. So. <coughs> so let's look at some progeny from golden sunset. We have uh, the Susan Walker golden sunset, and that was used some, oh, the progeny, I'm sorry, Progeny that was the most popular and the most um, prolifically awarded besides Golden Sunset itself was Rob Sand. And I, I know you've seen Rob Sand. It is that Maritone has been everywhere. And usually it's people's first Columbia. Uh, and this is it right here. <coughs> but you also have West Bay, Columbia Hawaiian Sunset by Rob Sand. But look at the colors that come out of that. Somehow, it's, and that's because Rob said has a lot of golden sunset in it. So you're rolling the dice, but it's a really nice pair of dice to come up with some of these combinations. Look at this. <coughs> Irene Gleason, Golden Sunset by Linda. And somehow this, uh, this color got tamed, but the shape is nice. Very nice color combinations. Sniffing, same thing. Look at the different um, <coughs> varieties. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I especially like Rusty Dusty, although it is kind of crowded on the stem. Columbia Memorial John Craig is sniffer with what we just saw by back cross to a species Triketra, trying to reduce that plant size and that spike length. And you can see how uh, this is the cover slide for the talk, mm -hmm. but you can just see how there's almost just like an Odon or an on sitting might be shingle or a tail might be shingle with the way the flowers are presented, the habit and arrangement of these are almost the same way here. And you can see that the, the starriness from the triketra is mitigated a little bit by the wide lip. So in the 90s, now that's the 70s and 80s and people are getting excited, but nobody really knows about mummies at this point. They're only grown in a very few places in Hawaii. And a young, I'm not a young lady, but a uh, AOS judge named Anita Aldridge brought him to Texas. And there was also something in Louisiana, I believe, uh, where they were doing some breeding with these upstart plants. And so Anita Aldridge wrote an article for the AOS magazine all about this. And it started getting, the pe it started getting people interested in 
Uh, and here is the first FCC for this genus, Tolumni a touch of class. And look at how round that is. And just almost solid yellow here and a very, very deep cordovan red in the petals. Just beautiful contrast. Uh, Anita passed away, I think, in 2002. But now we're in the 21st century. That was 1955 to the end of the century. Good day of Moyers breeding, passed on to his mentors, and that's about as far as they could go. Uh, now, in the 21st century, we started to get a lot of interest in breeding these plants. And so one of the first things we saw was orchid dung in the Dominican Republic being created for the sole purpose of Tolumnia hybridizing. Uh, well, or one of their main things was to, I'm, I'm sure they were growing other things to pay the bills and all that, but uh, they really got into Tolumnia breeding. A guy named William Savage, and one of the owners is an AOS judge and an AOS trustee called Nancy Mountford, and she was a principal in this. I do not know if Orchidon is still They're in still business. They still do hybridization, they do my blasting, and I can import that if need be. And there you have it from the man himself. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Everyone knows Mitch, so you can talk to him afterwards. So anyway, take a look at Columnia Orchidum's baby jar. Look at how full and colorful that flower is. Now remember, these are miniature orchids, so this flower is only about this big, but when you have 12 of them clustered around a compact spike on a small plant, very impressive, <coughs> very impressive. Uh, here's another one. Tolumnia orchidum treasured love. I think this was some registered in 2003 or something. Almost round. Remember those, those uh, uh, species I showed you earlier? They were kind of, you could still see the petals and everything. Everything seemed to be uh, a little, had a lot of space in between them. Look at this fullness of this flower here covering the petals so well. Beach fire. This is the Fab Four with Henekenii and that Bellatina uh, added to it. Although if you ask me what this brought to, you know, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how much it moved the needle to have those new species put in there, but it definitely produced a very nice plant. And there's, you know, yeah. with these Grexes, there could be something that's just a complete different color form that I just didn't see in my research. You know, this could be, because there is golden sunset way back uh, in, in the breeding here, there's still a possibility that this cross could have yellows and, and purples and all kinds of things. I wouldn't hesitate to buy any Tolumnia right now, even if you live in the coldest part of San Francisco, because uh, of the possibility of just getting something really just impressive uh, in color. And they're so small, they don't take up any space at all. Any pol Here's the Polchella uh, species by Tiny Tim, one of the parents of Golden Sunset. So all you're doing is taking half of golden sunset and accentuating the uh, roundness and the pink color. And this is what you get. Peppermint sprinkles, it got an AM of 81 as a 2015 remake, meaning somebody line bred some of those species, improved them, and then did a remake of the, of the hybrid. So fair is fair. Hawaii benefited from the uh, disruption of World War II in Southeast Asia. So, Southeast Asia got the tables turned because they had more land, lower labor costs, and a wonderful climate for a lot of these warm, warm to intermediate growers. So the breeding started to shift into Asia about 20 years ago um, as the uh, Hawaiian islands became more expensive to live in and work in. Uh, Tolumnia Snow Fairy is, was registered in 2002, I believe, in Thailand. Um, and you can see how it took the white background and just added a little color in the middle there. Uh, these, again, there are yellow versions and all kinds of things available. Uh, but Snow Fairy is mainly named because of the white background. Now, when you buy a Tolumnia, now, when you go onto the web and you look for Tolumnias for sale, um, it's going to say, oh, maybe you want a JRAC or maybe you want a G-POW, or maybe you want, you know, whatever. The point is, is some of the two biggest growers I know in Asia are JRAC, which is, I believe, in Thailand, and Zhihao, which is Taiwan. And 
those two places, when they get into something, they go all in. They are amazing. Um, JRAC Rainbow was registered in 2004, just after the turn of the new century. And look at the patterns on some of these, but also look at the spread. Look, they're not crowded anymore. They're, uh, the spike is actually semi-pendant a little bit and very nicely uh, spread uh, and presenting the flowers uh, to the viewer. And also the, you've got the variation in the, uh, in the coloration. But this is the name of the producer of all of these hybrids that you're gonna see that if you go to this website, you are gonna see a list of, for example, this rex, JRAC rainbow, this cross. You'll also see JRAC firm or JRAC flyer. And then you'll see a list. It's not, they're so, how can I say this? Because it's so amazing. They have so much variation in their crosses that they actually sell you by the, the clonal name, meaning if this particular clone, this cultivar has red spots and a white background, and the other one is yellow with purple blotches from the same cross, one is named ABC and the other one's named Purple Magic or whatever it's named. The point is, is you look at the clonal name to decide which one you want. You don't look at the cross because there's so much variation. If you want the purple one, you have to you have to take a look at the cultivar name, the nickname for the plant. And that's what you order because that's what they're medicine. They're taking this giant cross, producing all these variations, and then handpicking the best, mericloning them, and then selling them to you with the cross name and the clonal name. So Shawnee and I could be buying the same cross, a Jarek Rainbow, but depending on which cultivars we bought, we might have completely different plants because of the variation. It's just phenomenal. It's it's just it's very unusual to have. The orchid genes be so vigorous in its uh, color um, ranges. So, oops, what's going on with my thumb? Anyway, here we have, we saw JRAC Rainbow. This is JRAC Firm. You can go online right now, and I think there's at least 30 clonal names associated with this cross. Um, this one's Big Bang. This one is just called Yellow. But it's a nice yellow. <laughs> but the point is, look at the variation in all this. And so when you go to the Carl Smith website, he again will be selling you a JRAC firm, but he'll be selling you Big Bang specifically and not just something that came out of this press. So it's really an interesting way to shop. You're not just shopping for a, a cross, you're, you're shopping for an individual line of color uh, variation within a press. And the Golden Sunset grandparent basically allows that to happen. Here's JRAC Flyer. It's JRAC Firm by JRAC Rainbow. So we have a triple JRAC going on here. Uh, for some reason, when I looked at this, sometimes most of them are red. So maybe what I just told you <laughs> doesn't work for this particular uh, uh, instance, but this was registered in 2013. So you can see now we're in almost 60 years, 65 years of hybridization. This is an extremely complex genetic mix here for all of these. And then JRAC is just, here's one from 2015. Look at how round it's saturated. This is Mr. Zhihao. When you look him up in Taiwan, it's spelled Jia dash Ho. But for some reason, I guess he eliminates the hyphen in his uh, name, his nomenclature. This is Golden Sunray by Zhihao Rainbow. And this was registered just a few years ago, about nine years ago, about eight years ago. And look at here, yeah, you have an old spike that's rewarding. And look at what you're getting, it almost completely round, completely saturated. So finally, we have the issue about intergenetics. These were, what I showed you was all one the hybrids and species um, interbreeding with one another, but there are things in the Caribbean. Um, Rodriguez Diaz says, from Brazil and uh, other things that uh, Telumnias have been attempted to cross with. Um, Mr. Boyer, though, has some words about this saying, nowhere in orchid breeding is there as much wasted effort as trying to cross species and hybrids of Telumnias into other oncidiums or intergenerics of this oncidiniae. 
If they do cross, they lose their very Agata identity entirely, meaning their Tolumnia-ness. And because uh, Fairy Agata was the nickname for the Tolumnian portion of the Oncidian genus. Um, since they are completely dominated by the characteristics of the other plant. In other words, in his opinion, Tolumnias disappear when crossed with other Oncidiums and things. But we still have some people attempting. Uh, it's difficult at best, but with Rodriguez, Rodriguezia, which looks very, very similar. If you had one of those plants, it looks pretty much like a colonia with fan shaped leaves that are pretty stiff and everything. But the flowers are a little bit different and the coloration is less good. When you cross it with columnias, you get rod rumnia. And, but what you do get, if you do uh, find yourself with some good flowers, is more pendant inflorescences, which I think can be very pleasing. Imagine this plant with a map. Some semi pendant colorations and I mean, uh, uh, inflorescences and, and blooms on it. I think that would present very well than having something that just goes straight up. So I think that's an improvement. I have not seen any rod romnias personally, but here's a picture of one. That's a pretty colorful plant. And you can see the inflorescence is kind of, well, you can't see how it arches, but that's what the rod you see, rod rigesia brings to it. Ilanara is a trigeneric. Um, what happens when there's more than two, when there's two uh, uh, crosses, two genera crossing, they blend the names so they can have something that's not like uh, Ascacenda, there's Ascacentrum and Vanda, well, it's all Vanda now, but the point is when you have two genera and they blend them, they combine the names. But when you have three, you have to come up with something else. So they usually come up with some uh, honorific kind of name for a reader or somebody, or they just make a, a name up. Mokara, you hear the Mokara bandas. That's a man named genus name uh, from uh, three different genera in Southeast Asia, Aranda, Vanda, and, and Pepulanda. But anyway, uh, so you have a man named genus here called Ilonara. Uh, it's got Gomes or Rigesia and Tolumnia in it. And so instead of combining all of these words into some crazy unpronounceable thing, they call it Ilonara. Anyway, this again produces a pendant inflorescence and higher flower count. So that's a nice improvement too. As long as it retains the color of Tolumnia, I guess they don't have a problem with it. Gonza is a Brazilian Oncidium type. It was an Oncidium and then got broken out into its own gen uh, genus. Uh, it's called Golumnia, which I don't know, sounds sad to me. You know, I, I grow <laughs> Golumnias. <laughs> I'm sad. You know, I'd rather have something like Tolumnia. Anyway, it elevated the flower count and it has a city of characteristics, which kind of speaks to that comment that maybe the Tolumnia disappears in you know, a crossing that thing. So that's all I'm aware of if these are generics. I, I, I mean, commercially, I don't know of any that you can buy except these three uh, uh, genera here that have Tolumnia and really uh, in a generic. So here's uh, Rod Rumnia from Orchidum. Now, notice you get a lot, of th these spikes are, I think, hanging down and very, very pretty. Uh, just absolutely wonderful color. Uh, this is Rum Rod Rumnia Combs Good Choice by Orchidum Happy. Orchidum Happy is the Tolumnia. And then here we have Rod Rumnia Orchidum Valentine. Look at that, just glowing color. Again, look at the, sem the semi pendant inflorescence. I have not seen any Rod Rumnias at this show. Did anyone see any? No. I saw a few Tolumnias, but I have not seen Rod, Rod Rumnias. I'm going to Santa Barbara tomorrow. I'll keep my eye out and Thank see you. if there's any here. Oh, you have some too? No, I'm completely bad. I see. This is the man. You can tell. Okay. Uh, Roadside <laughs> okay. side ones that display basically not some. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, anyway, again, the culture of those intergenerics and tolumnias are very, very similar. You have to be careful because watering is the most important area, in my opinion, as a as an abusive water, <laughs> I consider watering the trickiest part. 
Um, feeding, orchids really don't need tons of food. They're used to having small amounts of fertilizer or decay material uh, on a constant basis, but it's the water that's the most important. Uh, any of these intergenerics or columnias will do not have pseudobulbs. They have nothing but roots and their own succulent nature in the leaves to pull water in. So they're dependent on a constant stream of rainfall and air movement to dry the roots out, as I've said many times already. Um, so if the plants appear to be shriveling, increase the humidity, don't start watering it more because it can't discharge and dry out its roots if you just keep watering it more frequently. What you wanna do is increase its humidity. And you can do this by the double pot method, perhaps. Double potting refers to taking a plant that has roots outside the pot and slipping it into a slightly larger pot that's clay or porous in some way that retains humidity. But the pot has the humidity. It doesn't make the roots uh, completely wet. Uh, they need to dry up or they will rot if left wet overnight. And I have killed some and I know that to be true. So when they grow intermediate to warm, but they can adapt. I think everyone in this room can grow one except my wife, but then she has me. <laughs> uh, they love being snugged into small pots. They love being mounted. I think we have mostly mounted here uh, on the edge of the table, but there's a couple in pots. And the, the medium is, is rock where those uh, pumice uh, balls that we see in the shops. But nothing that would hold water and retain moisture. Uh, I like bright but uh, diffuse light and they're ideal plants for your bathroom. But look at, again, no media, just a bunch of fine roots sticking out, but they really love to be mounted best of all. And if you're lucky, you just might get one of these. Here's a species, probably I'd say 12 inches high and about two feet wide. And look at all of these spikes, they're about 18 inches tall. This got a CCE, a Certificate of Cultural mm -hmm. Excellence from the AOS of 90 points, 1,300 flowers. Um, put that on your list. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, there's something called Tolumnias.com. My friend Manny Abar uh, taught me a lot about uh, Tolumnias. The Mr. Moyer, Goodale still has these books in publication. If you're thinking of doing crosses and stuff, you might pick one up, you can buy them from the AOS. Uh, Orchid Care, Equitana and Sidiums by Anita Aldrich is in the, one of the AOS bulletins. And she also did this article in 2001. And there's also this uh, uh, link to Orchids A to Z on the AOS website. Please join the AOS. It's about 50 bucks a year for a digital membership. It's wonderful and they have hacks like me writing articles. <laughs> so there you go. Any questions? Say so high humidity, give me a number. What are you hanging for? Uh, 70%. 70? Yeah. Yes. So in the Bay of Moyer's book, it says that the Columbia chromosomal number is 38, and the rest of the onset myelitis is 56 or 58. Um, as, do you think that's why let's, let's, let's watching them out? Or because that's what I've seen is that they're all, that the Columbia parents always have asked. Is the F1 and they don't produce F2? Do you think that's also why they're washing them out? Probably, although I don't feel qualified to speak on the genetics. But I would say that chromosomal incompatibility could be a very major factor in, in uh, either too much dominance by one parent or not enough compatibility. Yeah, there, there's a 20 or 38, the regular, all the others are 56 except for the. Thank you. The question was, would these be considered banded types? Now I know it looks kind of bandacious, but bandits are monopodial. And then what that means is they grow from the top and they just kind of keep growing. And if you cut them there, they might produce something at the base, but doing anything 
for a phalaenopsis or a vanda that they're both monopodial. From the top down, if you rot anything, you're really almost killing the plant because you're killing its terminal growing tip. Whereas with these, they've got a very short rhizome that's producing a new fan and not so much growing upwards uh, like a vanda would. So they're vandaceous only in the sense that they don't have pseudobulbs and need that humidity and occasional rainfall to keep their roots hydrated. That's a very similar, but that's a cultural thing, not a taxonomic issue. Yeah. One more question. Can the older plants grow the same plant or can they just I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Do they rebloom from the same plant? Uh, oh, yes. This one, I think, might rebloom from the same band and the same spike. Would they put out a new spike from the same? No, okay. no, it would rebloom from the same one. The thing is, you have to wait to see if this vegetatively dries up. But if it stays viable like this, don't touch it. You might get lucky and it'll rebloom. Similar to a phalaenopsis. You know, a lot of people just cut the spike, but sometimes a phalaenopsis will rebloom, especially if you cut it back to a, a flower node. But you'll always get a smaller flower. So the question is, you want sooner flowers and smaller, or do you want to cut it all the way back <coughs> and wait for a new inflorescence to make bigger flowers later? It's a, you know, or people, we are subject to these existential crises all the time. <laughs> no wonder so many of us are crazy, huh? <laughs> Especially this guy. <laughs> do the Zoom people have any questions? Oh, yes. You mentioned occasionally about Odonic blossoms. How does that fit into this picture? Oh, well. Um, Can you repeat the question? The question was I mentioned Odonic blossoms several times. How does it fit into this picture? Odonic blossoms, <laughs> like Columnias, were part of the Oncidium uh, alliance. And then they got broken out uh, a long time ago as Odonic blossoms, a separate genus. But lately, they were put back into Oncidiums to the chagrin of many people here in the West Coast who grow these things and don't agree with the reason why the, uh, uh, the classification is great. Well, um, telumnias have been broken out now. And I'm just referring to Ogas as kind of the poster child for it. you never know what the taxonomists are going to do next kind of thing. So there are telumnias now. Who knows what they're going to be in five years? You know. Yeah, I was just making snarky comments. The answer to your question is I was being snarky. Genetics, keep them telomeres, though. They're 38, 26. I'm pretty sure they'll keep them that way. Oh. And for the record, they are O dots. They are not obsidians. So. <laughs> Don't be <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, uh, any more questions? You can, you can get these plants, you can grow these plants, um, but they need bright light. So, you know, if, if you live, live in the fog belt, you, know, you might want to use lights or something, but they're not that hard to grow and, they, and they're, they're just so beautiful. They're so they cute. No, not direct sun. Bright, bright filtered light. light. Yeah. If you put them in a sunny place, put a curtain there or something like that. Oh, anything else? Well, thank you. Oh, got an announcement from Mitch. Oh, oh. and this is Mitch. He knows everything about where to get to more about. <laughs> I thank Carol for her warm kindness, but she, I think she's overestimating me, <laughs> but I appreciate that. I uh, just wanted to let everybody know, I'll put this in the newsletter as well, for all of you that got a lot of plants and other things that may need repotting after POE, I just put in my uh, bark order. So I have bags of bark available. We have some smaller ones for those that may not need a full 35 liter bag, but if you need a 40 liter, if you need a 35 liter bag of any small, medium, large size bark, come up to me. I also worked where tonight I brought in a few extra of the CalMag fertilizer. That is realistically the fertilizer you should be using in this area. The way we treat water in this city, they take the magnesium out. Magnesium is the center atom of chlorophyll. 
even though your leaves may look green, they're not producing enough chlorophyll, especially if you have softer leaf orchids like telumnias and on sit and I, they, we, you, I, if you do that, if you're seeing the, the, the height between grows not there, you're probably not getting enough chlorophyll per unit area of the leaf. So switch over to CalMag. We've got some extra tonight for sale, just letting everybody know if you need any, if you need any bark for what you're doing for repotting season as it comes up, feel free to contact me after, in between here and the raffle. Which is the, it's just the oh, the so fertilizer, it's uh, ten dollars. It's one teaspoon for five gallons. If you have less than fifty plants, it's pretty much a lifetime supply. <laughs> yes. Um, is there maybe an issue only for orders? Because in the Bay Area, they're not all <laughs> I have found it for all water, even in my in the mother bland of newer orchids in New Mexico. We have switched to that. We tripled the catacetum gross in one year. Tripled the size and the Rossi blossoms double. So if you're, especially on the soft release and the bifoliates are shining gold super moon, which is our big unifoliate. The, it normally was putting about one to three inches per growth. So, the, so the, the, the new growth is about one to three inches larger. We switched over to cow maggot this year. It put up six inches larger between Catlay and Lee. So it also helps extremely well for the big bifoliate Catlay. Yes. Everything, yeah, it's it's the fertilizer everybody should be using, no matter where you're at in the world. It is the standard now. Yeah, if you're looking for CalMag, that's where a lot of the fertilizers are now adding as a macronutrient that you're seeing it. So if they're adding it, but I use CalMag also for my divisions and yeah. else. I've got eight ounces. I can also do larger containers. Come by the greenhouse. I just a source. Or that too. <laughs> <laughs> but I ship it in two hundred pounds. So. Anyway, I had a thing here. I, I didn't want my talk to go too long, but I had a slide on buying a columnia. And if you really want to buy one and submit it for judging, just remember we like to see eight flowers on each inflorescence. We want that roundness and fullness. All spikes. Modern, uh, which are clear uh, symbols of modern crosses and good texture and flower flatness arrangement, things like that. So you got to buy one if you see that characteristic. You should always try to buy things that you can see. Yeah, I'm Okay. Thank you. A lot of That's nice. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, everyone. Thank you so much for for joining us here in the room and online. And um, have a great month. And we'll see you in April. Thank you. Oh, so we got. Yeah. This is mine.